Let's now look at a slightly more realistic scenario where the number of documents in the corpus is not 37 as in Shakespeare's corpus but about a million documents. That's not quite a lo uh, lot. It's still orders of magnitude smaller than the number of documents on the web. But it's still slightly more realistic than uh, just 37 documents in the corpus. Now, for a million documents, let's say these are uh, news documents. For a million news documents, it turns out that if you do some empirical research, you find that the number of distinct terms in such a corpus will be about 500,000. This is something we kind of find empirically and the actual values for different corpora may be different but let's just work with uh, values that are approximately in this range. What we are going to see is that even for this slightly larger corpus the term document incidence matrix solution that we just came up with is going to encounter some issues. If we build a term document incidence matrix using a million documents which have 500,000 distinct terms, the, the, the matrix that we build will have 500,000 rows because the number of rows is the number of distinct terms in the corpus and the number of columns is going to be 1 million because that's the number of documents in the corpus. So the number of cells in the term document incidence matrix will be 500,000 multiplied by 1 million which is 10 to the power 6 and this turns out to be uh, 0.5 times 10 to the power 12 or about half a trillion cells in the matrix. Now if you want to store a matrix with half a trillion ce cells in, in memory in order to work with it, how much memory would you require? Well we have each cell containing either a value of 0 or 1. So even if we assume simplistically that we can store each cell in one bit. Well, let's work with one byte first. Let's say that each cell is going to take up just one byte. That means we need these many number of bytes in main memory to work with this matrix. Now this turns out to be, so how much is 0.5 times 10 to the power 12 bytes? This turns out to be 500 times 10 to the power 9 bytes or 500 gigabytes. Now, no computer today, at least not the PCs that you find in the market, are going to have a RAM of size 500 gigabytes. And even if we were to store each cell using just one bit in some way, that would still be 500 divided by 8, number of 500 gigabytes divided by 8, because we would be using one eighth of the space since there are 8 bits in a byte that would still be quite large compared to the amount of RAM that is available in, in a typical laptop or PC today. So you can see that we're going to run out of space even with a small corpus with a million news documents. And as an aside, this corpus with a million documents, if they are typical news documents, will be about two to three book pages long. Each document will be about two to three book pages long which is about a thousand words. So let's also assume that each of these million documents is about a thousand words long and let's, uh, let's assume that each word is about six bytes long. These are not unreasonable assumptions. These are in fact uh, numbers calculated empirically from a typical news corpus. We'll come to that in a later uh, chapter, how we arrive at these values but let's just assume them for now. 
So each document has about a thousand words and each word has uh, takes up six bytes which includes the accompanying space or punctuation marks like commas, full stops and so on. So these six bytes include not just the characters of the word but also the accompanying spaces and punctuation marks. So if each document has a thousand words, six bytes per word, the size of a typical document will be 6000 bytes. And because there are a million documents, the size of the corpus as a whole will be a million times 6000 bytes, which is 6 times 10 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 6, or 6 times 10 to the power 9 bytes, which is 6 gigabytes. Now that's reasonably large compared to Shakespeare's corpus, but it's still orders of magnitude smaller than the amount of data that's available on the web. So going back to this uh, term document incidence matrix, we saw that it's impractical to build a term document incidence matrix even for a corpus of these many documents or this much size. So how do we cut down on the space? We really need to cut down on the space in order to successfully build a system which will be able to handle queries on this corpus. And the first thing the first thing that we need to notice here in order to come up with a more efficient solution is that this term document incidence matrix is going to be a very sparse matrix. What is a sparse matrix? If you've done a course on data structures you would remember that a sparse matrix is a matrix in which most of the entries are zero. That is the number of non-zero entries is a small fraction of the total number of entries in the matrix. Now I'm going to claim here that the matrix, the term document incidence matrix that we generate over here is going to be a very sparse matrix. That is the non-zero or the one entries are going to be sparsely present in the matrix. Why is that true? Well, to see why that's true, let's just focus on a particular column of the matrix. Let's say we focus on this document, Antony and Cleopatra. Of course, I just said that we are looking at a typical news column, whereas here we have a play of Shakespeare, but we are just working with a toy example for the purpose of illustration here. Uh, we want to show something diagrammatically here, that's why I'm using this example. So if you just focus on this document, you can see that it's going to have a certain number of ones in the column vector which correspond to the words which appear in this document. Now let's try to derive an upper bound on the number of ones that can appear in this column vector and see what percentage of the total number of entries in the vector that is. So how can we maximize the, the number of ones in this column vector? the larger the diversity of words that appears in this document, the more the number of ones in this column vector. Because if there are if there are more words of different kinds present in a document, then when we pre-process the corpus and parse that document for the purpose of generating this matrix, we will we will be adding a one to the matrix whenever we encounter a new word for the first time. So if every word in the document is a new word, that is how we will maximize the number of ones in the matrix. Whereas if there are words which appear multiple times in the document, then we are not going to work with the... When we encounter that word again, the first time we encounter that word, we are going to add a one. But when we encounter that word again, we are not going to do anything. Because we are dropping information about how many times the word is appearing in the document. We're just keeping track of the presence or absence of the word in the document. And we're also not tracking what the positions of the words in the documents uh, were. So if you just have to note the presence or absence, it's basically how many distinct words appear that appear in the document that that are important. That's important. So if we want to maximize the number of ones, we have to that's going to happen with a document where all the thousand words are different. So what is the maximum percentage of ones possible in a column vector? 
we can at most have a thousand ones in a, in a single column vector whereas we know that the length of the column vector is 500,000 because there are 500,000 rows here so if we calculate the percentage of ones in such an artificial extreme scenario that turns out to be 10 to the power 5 divided by 500,000 which is just 1 by 5 or 0.2 percent so 0.2 percent is the upper bound on the percentage of ones in a column vector and this applies to any column vector this means that even in the matrix as a whole the maximum percentage of ones is bounded from above by 0.2 percent we could have alternately just computed the maximum possible number of ones in the matrix as a whole which would be the maximum possible number of ones in a single column vector multiplied by the number of columns so that would be a thousand multiplied by the number of columns which is the number of documents and that's a million so this comes out to be about 10 to the power 9 or a billion ones now since the total number of cells in the matrix are 0.5 trillion the percentage of ones in this case would be a billion divided by 0.5 trillion times 100 which also comes out to be 0.2 percent because that would be 10 to the power 9 divided by 0.5 times 10 to the power 12 multiplied by 100 and and this is 1 by 5 or 0.2 percent so this means that at most 0.2 percent of the entries in the matrix are 1 or at least 99.8 percent of the entries in the matrix are 0 so this shows that this term document incidence matrix is a highly sparse matrix now how do we cut down the amount of space so that we can have a more practical solution for uh, building a system that can answer uh, the query that we had so typically how sparse matrices are represented is not by storing is not by allocating space for every cell in the matrix but just recording the non-zero positions so if we just keep track of the non-zero positions we will need to keep track of only 0.2 percent of the original number of cells so by default we're going to assume that an entry is going to be a zero unless we are explicitly recording that it's a one so for example if you look at the row vector here for Brutus Brutus appears in three of the plays in this toy example the first one the second one and the fourth one so instead of storing this entire row vector which will be uh, a million documents long in the example in, in the example that we saw we just have to store we just have to record in which documents Brutus is actually present so that's document number one document number two and document number four um, it Brutus is not present here so this entry is a zero so it's we just have three ones in this row vector and notice that for the purpose of uh, this example we are assuming that each document is assigned a unique doc ID so the documents are numbered from 1 to a million so the first document is uh, numbered 1 the second one is assigned an ID of 2 and so on so the way we will store this row vector for Brutus is not by storing all the entries but by only recording the doc IDs 1 2 and 4 with Brutus likewise we are going to associate with the term Caesar not this entire row vector but just a list of five doc IDs 1 2 4 5 and 6 and if you look at the Calpurnia row vector because Calpurnia appears in only one of the plays which is the second document we'll just record the number 2 for Calpurnia so we are only recording the one positions and this is the standard way in which sparse matrices are represented in order to conserve space 
Now notice that this is pretty much what the index at the back of a typical book or novel looks like. In a book index you have an alphabetical list of words at the end and for each word you have a list of page numbers on, uh, on which that word appeared. So if you were to imagine uh, each page of the book as a separate document with the page numbers being the doc IDs then the structure we have here is identical to the index at the back of a book. So in case you forget what this solution is you can just remember what how the index at the back of a book looks like and you'll be able to immediately recall this structure where you have uh, terms on one side and then a list of doc IDs on the other side in increasing order of IDs. And this brings us to the notion of an inverted index which is at the heart of what information retrieval is about. An inverted index is this structure that we just came up with where for each term t we store a list of all the documents that contain t and we don't actually store the documents here we we would have assigned a unique doc id to each document and we store a list of doc ids corresponding to the documents containing that term t so this is an inverted index you have these terms on one side and then you have lists of doc ids on the other side most often we just call this not as an inverted index but just an index or a search index so when the word index appears in the context of an information retrieval system it means an inverted index or the index at the back of a book as a close analogy a database index is different so you shouldn't get confused between uh, uh, these two no these two indices a database index and an IR index which are two different things